Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, welcome to the Montesquieu Forum. Uh, today, the Montesquieu Forum goes to the movies. I th that was funny, thank you. I appreciate <laughs> so and laughed at that. Uh, before introducing our guest speaker, uh, I thought I'd show the opening scene of the movie that will be the subject of our talk today as a way of, uh, so to speak, breaking the ice uh, so we can have a relaxed conversation. Just play the first three minutes or so of the film. You know I'm a sporting man. I like to lay a capable bet, <laughs> but I ain't that sporting. When I fix a fight, say I uh, pay a three to one favor to throw a goddamn fight, I figure I got the right to expect that fight to go off at three to one. But every time I land back with a son of a bitch Bernie Bonton, before I know it, the odds is even up. Or worse, I'm betting on the short money. The sheeny knows I like short things. He's selling the information, I fixed the fight. Out of town money goes pouring in. The odds go straight to hell. I don't know who's selling to it. Maybe the Los Angeles company. I don't know. The point is, Bernie ain't satisfied with the honest dollar he can make with the pig. He ain't satisfied with the business I do on his book. He is selling tips on how I bet. And that means part of the payoff that should be riding on my head is riding on someone else's. So, back we go to these questions. Friendship, character, ethics. So it's clear what I'm saying. As mud. It gets all business men can't expect no return from a fixed fight. Now, if you can't trust a fix, what can you trust? For a good return, you gotta go betting on cheese. And then, you're back with anarchy. Right back in the jungle. That's why ethics is important. What separates us from the uh, animals, a, a piece of bird, a piece of prey, ethics. Whereas uh, Bernie Burntown is a horse of a different color, ethics wise. As in, he ain't got any. You sure it's Bernie, son, yeah. It ain't elves. No one else knows about the fix? No one that ain't got ethics. What about the fighters you pay to tank out? We only pick fighters we know we can put the fear of God in. Any other bookies know you're playing one else's book? Uh, I lay an occasional bet with Mink Rory. But it ain't Mink, I'll vouch for that. How do you know? It ain't Mink. Uh, Mink is Eddie Dane's boy. Of course, the Dane always knows about the fix. And what the hell is that supposed to be? Let it drift. All it means is a lot of people know. I guess you ain't been listening. Sure, other people know. That's why we gotta go to this question of character. To determine just who exactly is chiseling in on my face. And that's how we know that it's Bernie Birnbaum, the schmott I kid. Because ethically, he's kinda shaky. So you wanna kill him? For starters. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Casper. Bernie pays for protection. I should really try to follow that course of policy when it comes to my students. <laughs> Have them pay for protection. Our speaker today is Dr. Stephen Lensner, who is a Salvatore uh, Center Fellow at Claremont McKenna College. He received his PhD from the Department of Government at Harvard University. I've known Steve a decent number of years and I've learned two things about him that you will see on display today. Uh, first of all, he has this marvelous capacity of understanding things by starting with the smallest details and working out. 
and he knows them in fine detail. Secondly, he has a sense of humor. It is a very dry sense of humor. So dry that on occasion one won't know whether to laugh. Indeed, I have been with him and I've been the only one in the room laughing. You are funny. Yes, he is funny. <laughs> a dry sense of humor, a wonderful mind, and Professor Dr. Lenzner is here today to be talking about A Lie and No Heart, uh, reflections on uh, the Cone Brothers of uh, Mills Crossing. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Lenzner to the Montesquieu Park. First, I would like to thank Stuart for those kind words, as well as the invitation to speak about Miller's Crossing, which I, in my status as a renowned cinematic authority, uh, will begin by asserting is the greatest film ever made. My talk is largely adapted from an essay I wrote about 20 years ago, which was published in Perspective, Perspectives on Political Science, and which recently reached a double-digit readership when I paid my father a tidy sum to go over it. Uh, my reason for not presenting something new is less to be attributed to my laziness than to the fact that I'm not sure that I have all that much to add to what all of the essay's readers regard as a classic, not to say the classic, of cinematic interpretation. Uh, I will, however, supplement what I take from the essay with one or two additional observations I've subsequently made. I will, in the course of my talk, be quoting various exchanges from the movie. I should let you know that I had raised with Stewart the possibility of showing the clips of those exchanges. Though Stewart told me that doing so would not be a problem, he, in a characteristically impressive way, urged me not to do so. I believe I can quote his admonition verbatim. By Zeus, he said, but why would you want to? Why would you deprive the audience of the pleasure of hearing those lines as they should have been delivered in the film in your deeply resonant nasal Jewish voice? <laughs> By Zeus, I say, you and your damnable modesty. Uh, since I could not gainsay Stuart's insightful words, I agreed, my altogether admirable modesty notwithstanding, uh, to read those exchanges for your sake with the compromise that we would show the opening scene as it appeared in the film so as to provide a contrast between myself and the actors. My contention is that Joel and Ethan Cohn's 1990 film Miller's Crossing is an elaborate philosophic allegory depicting first and foremost the protagonist's descent to self-knowledge and his almost simultaneous discovery of natural right or justice. I will also address the film's treatment of other important problems, such as the nature of political rule, the questionable character of the founding of Christianity, and the limited yet important point of contact between classical and Machiavellian politics. Part one, the character of rule, Leo and Johnny. Miller's Crossing takes place in an unnamed prohibition era town ruled by a political machine that offers unofficial liquor and gaming licenses. The film opens with a theoretical debate of sorts between Leo, the town's Irish boss, and his upstart Italian rival, Johnny Casper. The scene is Leo's office. Johnny Casper speaks the first words of the film and with them introduces three of the film's central concerns, friendship, character, and ethics. Character, Casper's ethical problems, as we have seen, pertain to fixed fights. Without a trace of irony, he denounces Bernie's venality, describing it as a threat to the entire moral order. Given the seriousness of Bernie's offense, Casper says he has no choice but to kill him. The visit to Leo is a courtesy call to avoid future misunderstanding. Leo reacts rather unexpectedly. He tells Casper to expect trouble if he kills Bernie. To quote Leo, far as I know, what I don't know in this town ain't worth knowing. The cops haven't closed any of your dives, and the DA hasn't touched any of your rackets. You haven't bought any license to kill bookies, and today I ain't selling any. Casper erupts at Leo and departs. From the start, then, the film brings out key differences between the two bosses, differences that become accentuated as the film progresses. Leo doesn't lose his cool. Casper, on the other hand, is easily agitated. He is a parody of an Aristotelian gentleman. He speaks throughout the film of ethics and friendship and is the only character who is seen to have a family, a condition he praises as the complete life. Casper sees himself as a virtuous man. Yet despite, or perhaps, perhaps because of, his rigid principles, he is exceptionally unfit for political life. 
he demonstrates time and again a striking lack of judgment. Uh, Leo, the more gentlemanly in action and demeanor, has no such pretensions. He is entirely at home within the horizon of politics. What he doesn't know ain't worth knowing. Two, the character of reason, Tom. Witnessing Leo and Leo and Casper's conversation are the right hand man, Tom Regan and Eddie Dane. Tom remains silent throughout the discussion, literally in the background, and registers a look of surprise and disapproval when Leo cautions Casper against killing Bernie. Tom's silence is characteristic. To the extent possible, he prefers giving advice in private. As soon as Casper and the Dane leave, he voices his objections. Tom ex exits with the request of Leo. Think about what protecting Bernie gets us. Think about what offending Casper loses us. Leo good-naturedly replies, come on, Tommy, you know I don't like to think. Tom advises him to think about whether you should start. Leo's response to Casper, the error, the error that gives rise to the film's action, is not a simple last, la, lapse in judgment. Leo has been seduced into protecting Bernie by Bernie's wantonly attractive sister, Verna. At 4 a.m. the next evening, Leo shows up at Tom's apartment. He can't find Caverna, and in light of his feud with Casper, thinks she may be in danger. Tom tells Leo, Verna can take care of herself, and that she is using Leo. In this scene, the classical aspects of Tom's character come to the fore. Leo, without reference to Polemarchus, sets forth the central definition of justice discussed in Book One of Plato's Republics, helping friends, harming enemies. Tom rebuts that understanding. For him, the only justifiable ground for action is reason, or to be more precise, the only defensible action in the necessarily imperfect world of politics is one that has a reason. It is worth noting that Tom's standard of judgment is intellectual, not moral. He does not blame the, uh, Verna for what might be taken to be her moral shortcomings, uh, but Leo for his intellectual ones. Leo makes no attempt to answer Tom on, on political or intellectual grounds. To his credit, he recognizes Tom's superior prudence. Tom understands the, the demands of politics better than anyone. As the tension escalates between Leo and Casper, Tom and Re Leo replay these roles the next day in Leo's office. Leo, mistakenly believing that Casper has killed one of his men, wants to jump on the guinea hard with both feet. Tom again objects. Protecting Bernie won't be good for anyone. Again, Tom is the voice of reason. We see most clearly here the understanding of justice that he expresses from the outset, the view from which he ascends to a certain type of natural right or natural justice. That view re resembles what Leo Strauss calls conventionalism, in which the very distinction between just and unjust is merely a human supposition or human convention. In the town of Miller's Crossing, a number of rules are tacitly agreed upon for the sake of convenience and mutual prosperity, that is, a certain type of common good. Those rules, such as capital punishment for selling information about a fixed fight, might seem arbitrary and unjust, perhaps even cruel, but yet they deserve respect precisely because they are agreed upon. The rules provide a secure framework with which their adherents can pursue their private interests, interests whose uh, ends cannot meaningfully be called unjust. Tom is not at all concerned that Bernie's punishment may be disproportionate to his crime. Rather, Tom, it, Tom's aim is to protect interest, the towns and Leo's. He, uh, he does not men once mention or consider his own interest. With one noteworthy exception, Tom is the only character in the film who explicitly voices consideration and concern for the common good however that good may be defined. It may even be that his own interest would be better served by encouraging Leo to protect Verna. By failing to do so, Tom risks losing the, uh, by Leo to protect Bernie. By failing to do so, Tom risks losing Verna, with whom perhaps he is in love. The noteworthy exception is a, worth a quick glance, if for no other reason than it is my favorite scene in the film, beating out Casper's questioning of Tom if he likes kids, to which Tom gives the perfect answer, a gruff and emphatic no. Uh, the exception occurs in a brief dialogue uh, between Tom and the none too quick police chief, O'Doul, in which the two characters, as it were, reverse roles. O'Doul, 
listen, Tom, I'm just the chief around here, so don't bother telling me if you don't happen to feel like it, but what the hell is Leo doing? Make him listen to you, Tom. It ain't right, all this fuss over one sheeny. Let Casper have Bernie. Jesus, what's one more Hebrew, more or less? It's no good for anyone. You said as much yourself. Tom, first off, we'll do, I can say what I please to Leo and about him. You can't. Second, once Leo decides, that's that. And if that stick's going down, there are plenty of other coppers wouldn't mind being chief and could swallow it clean. O'Doul. Jesus, Tom, I was just speculating about a hypothesis. I know I don't know nothing. This is a wonderful reversal of the common state of affairs. It would be an ideal world in which reason, using the language of authority, could tell authority not to use the language of reason. Only the wise man should have the right to speak freely. To return to Tom and Leo's exchange, Leo is clearly exacerbating his mistake in this scene. Yet, even as he does so, we can see why he is a successful boss. He not only recognizes Tom's superior prudence, but presumably has followed his guidance in the past. On the whole, Leo surrounds himself with competent men in whom he inspires loyalty. He has good judgment. In stark contrast, Casper's right-hand man, the Dane, though intelligent and loyal, is a poster boy for brutality. And we meet two other assistants of Casper's, one stupid, the other sadistic. Even Leo's mistake, although by no means defensible, does not speak too badly of him. Verna is young, intelligent, and attractive. One could go wrong for worse reasons. Sandwich admits the scenes just discussed, we have a brief glimpse of Tom reading a newspaper. He is reading about a horse, Thunderclap, he had bet on heavily and unsuccessfully in the hopes of winning enough to pay off his debt to a bookie named the Tsar. That, rise, uh, that loss gives rise to another allusion to Tom's classical character. When asked, they shoot your horse, he replies, if there's any justice. In a film relatively rich with the language of moral virtue, this is the only use of the word justice. It should not be altogether surprising that the term arises in such a context. The Republic, the dialogue on justice, opens with an attempt to compel Socrates to watch men with torches race on horseback. And like Socrates, Tom views just, justice not as something to be preached, but as a problem. He wonders if justice exists. Tom's gambling debts are central to the plot of Miller's Crossing. Three of the four characters who seek Tom's favor, Leo, Casper, and Bernie, do so by offering to bail him out with Lazar. In the first scene, Tom declines Leo's offer and then encourages Leo to think. But Tom's reaction to his other two offers is markedly different. To both Bernie and Casper's proposal, Tom replies, I'll think about it. On the basis of these scenes, it is fair to say that Tom is both very well known and almost entirely misunderstood. Everyone seems to know about his debts, his external situation, but no one understands his motivations. People take it as a matter of course that he has a price. Yet, at least in Tom's case, necessity does not breed venality. In a much later scene, after he is signed on with Casper, Tom remarks on the difficulty of knowing other people. He has been trying to convince Casper that the Dane is selling him out. Casper, but I don't know, I don't know. Why would Eddie cross me like that? Money, okay, everyone likes money, but somehow it don't seem like him, and I know the Dane. Tom, nobody knows anybody, not that well. Tom makes the same statement after confronting Verna with the suspicion that she shot Rub. He states his maxim immediately after she had replied, come on, Tom, you know me a little. Tom is the only character who finds the grounds of human action genuinely perplexing. He is the only character who finds self-knowledge problematic. Other characters find particular acts bewildering, but their bewilderment is the result of their certainty that they know what people are capable of and behavior that does not conform to their expectations in no way threatens their complacency. Uh, part three, seduction and error is prelude to self-knowledge. Leo's mistake is a direct consequence of Verna's seduction. Her charm also seems to be at the root of Tom's only lapse in judgment. Leo's initial assault on Casper is pro prompted by the mistaken assumption that, Tom is, uh, that Casper has declared war by killing his man. Uh, Tom learns of Casper's innocence literally moments before the war begins in earnest, with a police raid on one of Casper's clubs. Just before the police enter, Casper makes his attempt to, to bribe Tom. 
a felony which establishes his innocence. Tom explains to Verna, Casper just tried to buy me into settling his tiff with Leo, which he'd hardly do if he was waging war. Because Casper is innocent, and the murder weapon is a 22 caliber gun, a pop gun, a woman's gun, Tom tentatively concludes that Verna has killed Rug to keep her, uh, uh, to keep her affair with Tom from Leo. Two scenes later, after Leo is nearly assassinated, Tom again urges him to give up Bernie for the sake of a truce with Casper. Tom's argument has two parts, one general, one particular. First, the general. Leo's brush with death makes him look weak. Tom, listen to me, Leo. Last night made you look vulnerable. You don't hold elected office in this town. You run it because people think you run it. Once they stop thinking it, you stop running it. Leo, what's the matter, Tommy? You think I can't take care of myself? Tom, I know you can't. Leo's limitations come through better in, in this exchange than in any other point in the film. His tone is dismissive. He is unaware of the source of his authorities, and he is not open to seeing it. For if he saw it, he would recognize the precariousness not only of his present situation, but of his position altogether. Leo is too manly for his own good. Tom's emphatic statement that he knows Leo cannot take care of himself is one of his very few claims to knowledge in the film. And it makes quite a contrast with his maxim, nobody knows anybody. Apparently a perceptive judge can know the limits of many at their best. Tom then sets forth the second, more concrete argument, that Casper is innocent in Rugg's death. Yet instead of simply repeating the compelling explanation that he had offered to Verna, Tom tries to convince Leo that Verna is the murderer. In the second and final exhortation in the name of reason, Tom implores Leo, think about it, just this one time, who was Rugg following? This somewhat unreasonable appeal to reason fails, and Tom again shifts ground, this time appealing to experience and friendship. He asks Leo to take his word for it that Verna had good reason to kill Rugg, that he knew where she was sleeping and who with. Leo refuses and Tom again raises the stakes. I don't ask much and I don't ask often. Trust me on this or to hell with you. When Leo still resists, Tom, for reasons unknown to himself, declares that Verna was with him on the night Rugg was shot. Leo, after pummeling da uh, Tom down two flights of stairs, then announces, it's the kiss off. If I never see him again, it'll be soon enough. Part four, self-knowledge. Miller's Crossing consists of two parallel parts of roughly equal length, each of which ends with the problem of self-knowledge. In the scene following the kiss-off, the last scene of the first part, Verna comes to Tom. Verna, it worked. Whatever you did, Leo told me were quits. But you know I didn't have anything to do with Rugg. Tom, maybe not. Anyway, that isn't what soured him on you. Verna, oh, you and me, huh? You always take the long way to get around to get what around to get what you want, don't you, Tom? You could have just asked, Tom, what did I want? Verna, me. Tom's ability to question himself perhaps more than anything else distinguishes his character. The most starkly rational human being is the only one capable of seeing that his actions often defy reasonable explanation. Tom does not know why he told Leo about his affair with Verna. He surely was not impelled by guilt. Verna and Leo both suggest answers to Tom's question. Verna comes in the final part of the uh, final scene of the first part. Leo in the final scene of the film. The first part concludes simply with this exchange. Verna, I guess we both double-crossed Leo. There's no getting around that. I guess he's well rid of both of us. The two of us were about bad enough to deserve each other. Tom, are we? Verna, we're a couple of heels. Tom, yes, we are. Verna has no doubts with regard to uh, Tom's particular action with Leo, and she also believes that she understands both herself and Tom, that she sees what they are essentially. She believes she possesses self-knowledge. Moreover, unlike Tom, her, judgment, her standard of judgment is almost entirely moral, not to say moralistic. They deserve each other because of their shared disloyalty. By questioning her, her assertion that they belong together, Tom shows that they do not belong together. His knowledge of his lack of self-knowledge separates him from her. In the same manner that, that Verna assumed that Tom's actions were dictated by, her, by his feelings for her, Leo assumes that Tom was acting on his behalf. 
Toward the end of the final scene of the film, Leo says to Tom, I suppose you picked that fight with me just to tuck yourself in with Casper, so as to engineer Casper's downfall from within. Tom responds, I don't know. Do you always know why you do things, Leo? The question seems to be outside of Leo's comprehension. All he can answer is, of course I do. Like Verna, Leo believes that he possesses self-knowledge. Both Verna's and Leo's answers as to Tom's motivation seems plausible, neither seems sufficient. To the extent that Verna's answer is true, it entails a somewhat unsatisfying ending in which the wise man's foolishness costs him what he cares for most. In this context, it is worth noting that Tom is the only character in the film to speak of love. He does so twice. He first uses the word in the scene after his grief on behalf of the common good, after he delicately suggests that Verna's activities with Leo bear a resemblance to those commonly associated with fallen ladies we witness the following exchange. Verna, what is this about? You want me to stop seeing Leo? Why don't you just say so? Tom, I don't like being played for a sucker. That game might work with Leo, but it won't work with me. Verna, you think last night was just camp more campaigning for my brother? Tom, I can see the uh, angles. Verna, you're a pathetic rumhead. Tom, and I love you, Angel. After Tom's half sarcastic sarcastic declaration, he grabs and kisses Verna. She responds with an impressive right hook. Um, uh, Tom's second reference to love makes his first more worthy of attention. In the second half of the film, while trying to make Casper, Casper believe his rather fanciful story that the Dane was crossing him, Tom suggests love as an explanation for the Dane's portrayal. More precisely, he says, there's always that wild card when love is involved. Perhaps Tom makes that suggestion with his own actions in mind. The end of the first part suggests that at that point, if not before, the quest for self-knowledge is becoming central for Tom. The end of the film suggests it will continue to be. Can we, to jump ahead for a moment, rest satisfied with the film's ending? Doesn't Tom deserve the hand of Verna more than Leo does? To be sure, Tom ends up with self-knowledge, and that is a fine thing although the girl is more tangible. Um, nevertheless, one can argue that the ending is appropriate. Leo and Verna belong together. Um, uh, the parallel, uh, parallel endings of the two parts suggest that Tom is to be fundamentally distinguished from both Verna and Leo, and in the same manner. To state it in somewhat pompous language, Tom cannot be with Verna or work for Leo because there can be no genuine union between the knower and the non-knower. Viewed in this light, one might say the film's ending is the only appropriate one. Tom must be alone. His ascent to self-knowledge in the film can be viewed as an allegorical de depiction of philosophic conversion. To become a philosopher is to deaden one's heart to what goes against reason. It is be to become radically solitary. Verna's summary judgment of Tom, that's you, all over, a lie in no heart is a good shorthand description of the philosopher's relation to his fellow human beings. To be sure, the reflection of the philosopher that we see in Tom makes the most impressive human spectacle in Miller's Crossing. Yet given that all that Tom has to sacrifice to reach that stage, essentially his whole past, his friends, and his home, it seems that the philosophic life is not without cost. Five, a very brief look inside Casper's office. Miller's Crossing begins in Leo's office. The film's second part begins with our first glimpse of Casper's office. The contrast between the two is telling. Leo has an acute sense of what his office requires. It is a stately and manly suite appropriate to his position. It is comfortable and projects an air of confidence. In short, his office is a reflection of his character. Casper's office similarly reflects his character. It is drab and uncomfortable. It is an office aspiring to mediocrity. Um, in the first scene of part two, we witness Tom's successful attempt to ally himself with Casper. He does so by giving Casper Bernie. That is, by telling him the location of Bernie's hideout. Casper's handling of Tom's defection demonstrates a singular lack of the qualities necessary for political life. Given Tom's former position, Casper shows a remarkable willingness to take on faith his prospective loyalty. Even before Tom offers any concrete sign to allay suspicion, 
Casper is enthusiastic about Tom's virtues. We all know you can be useful to, a, uh, to us, a smart kid such as yourself, the man who walks behind the man and whispers in his ear. I guess you could be useful in spades. Even more foolishly, Casper offers Tom the position of right-hand man in the presence of his current and uh, rather homicidal right-hand man, the Dane. Not until the Dane makes clear suspicions does Casper seek evidence of the genuineness of his newfound ally. At that point, Tom offers up Bernie. Um, Miller's Cross, uh, part five, six, Miller's Crossing, the problems of natural right and Christianity. Uh, Casper orders Tom to go with two of his flunkies to pick up Bernie. They are to take Bernie to Miller's Crossing, a wooded area outside of town, and kill him. What Tom does not know is that Casper is also given the word that, it, uh, that Tom is to do the actual killing. The weaselly, vicious Tic Tac tells Tom to take him into the woods and whack him. Tom seems to have no choice but to comply. Yet Casper's inept flunkies do not follow him into the woods. Bernie seizes on this opportunity to plead for his life. Bernie, Tom, Tommy, you can't do this. You don't bump guys. You're not like those animals back there. It's not right, Tom. They can't make us do this. It's a wrong situation. They can't make us different people than we are. We're not muscle, Tom. I never killed anybody. I used a little information for a chisel, and that's all. It's my nature, Tom. I can't help it. Somebody hands me an angle, I play it. I don't des deserve to die for that. Do you think I do? I'm just a grifter. But I'll tell you what, I never crossed a friend, never killed anybody, never crossed a friend, nor you, I'll bet. We're not like those animals. This is not like us. This is some op dream. I'm praying to you. I can't die. I can't die out here in the woods like a dumb animal. I'm praying to you. Look in your heart. Look in your heart. You can't kill me. Look in your heart. This is the first scene in Miller's Crossing. It takes place literally in the center of the film. That is its chronological midpoint. Not surprisingly, it is of considerable importance. Bernie appeals to two ideas, right and nature. First, he claims that it is not right or just to be executed for such a minor offense. Right demands that the punishment be proportionate to the crime. Second, he appeals to nature, understood as the essence or the character of a being. Bernie is not genuinely responsible for his act. Nature is. He could not have acted otherwise. He is what he is. And for the same reason, Tom cannot kill him. Tom is what he is, a man of peace by nature. Bernie's appeal to nature can be summarized thus. By doing violence to Bernie, Tom would be doing violence to himself, to his nature. He would become someone else. These arguments, of course, raise all sorts of questions. What is the connection between right and nature? Does right have a nature? Bernie claims he should not be punished for his nature. Is this based on a general principle? Can no one be punished who acts in accordance with his nature? Can natures not be changed in a desirable way? What about bad natures? Is punishment simply unjust by nature? Can Bernie's intended punishment be called just by nature? Bernie attempts to persuade Tom through both pathetic whining and argument. Which is more effective? What is the connection between argument, reason, and natural right? Why is it that in Miller's Crossing, nature shows itself only in response to human necessity? Are the demands of necessity consonant with those of nature and vice versa? In any case, and for whatever reason, Bernie's appeal to, Nate, to Tom in the name of right in nature succeeds. The term nature is used only once in Miller's Crossing in this appeal to Tom. He is the only character with whom such an appeal could succeed. The scene in the forest also raises the question of the significance of the title Miller's Crossing. In light of Bernie's execution and resurrection, one can say that at least one of its meanings is connected to the cross, to the crucifixion of Christ. Consider the quasi-Christian tone of Bernie's pleading. I'm praying to you. Look in your heart. God bless you. Bernie, the turncoat homosexual Jew who rises from the dead, can be viewed as representing Christ. Christianity arises in weakness. It preys on guilt. It is a vain hope to overcome mortality. I can't die. You can't kill me. Bernie is identified for most of the film by ethnic slurs, Shmarta, Shini, Hebrew, Yid. Yet after his death is verified, he is referred to only as Bernie. That is to say, during his second life, Bernie loses his identity as a Jew. 
Let me add here that my interpretation of Bernie and Jesus is confirmed by the Cohn's Big Lebowski, wherein they have John Turturro, the actor who played Bernie, play a sexual deviant named Jesus, one who states in a most emphatic manner that his name is not Jesus, but Jesus. Uh, uh, part seven, uh, Machiavellian natural right. How, how am I in time? Uh, um, uh, in which I uh, discuss the manner in which the film, uh, as it were, establishes the case for natural right of a sort. To, ex to the extent that it can be, the problem of natural right is resolved by Tom's execution of Bernie. By threatening to expose Bernie publicly if he does not show up at Tom's apartment at 4 a.m. with $2,000 skip money, Tom has arranged things in such a manner that he expects Bernie to try to kill him at that precise moment. Under a different set of pretenses, Tom has convinced Casper to go to the apartment at the same time with a considerable sum of money. Tom enters immediately after Bernie has killed Casper. Bernie, I get it, so you set me up. But you, if you knew I'd come looking to kill you, how do you know I still won't? Tom, nothing in for you now. With him dead, we got nothing on each other. Let me have the gun. Bernie, why? Tom, pin this on the day. Bernie, here, and he hands Tom the gun. Burnt Tom, Bernie, we can't hang this on the Dane. Eddie Dane is dead. It's got to be you. I mean, it was your gun. Bernie, what is this? You took my gun. It's just your word against mine. Tom, not necessarily. Bernie, you can't just shoot me like that. Jesus Christ, it don't make sense. Tommy, Tommy, look in your heart. Look in your heart. Bernie, having become Christ, no longer prays to Tom. He only asks him to look in his heart. Tom, what heart? He shoots him in the forehead. How might Tom's execution of Bernie be best explained? If Tom were an ordinary individual, one might simply say that his action was prompted by moral indignation or the desire for revenge, or the considerable overlap between the two. Yet he seems to be singularly bereft of such passions. He states early in the film that he doesn't hate anyone, and nothing suggests that this is changed by film's end. He demonstrates not a whit of self-righteous anger when killing Bernie. To the extent that he feels anything for Bernie, he feels contempt. And contempt is not the sort of feeling that leads one to kill. He is anything but bloodthirsty. And he has no angle. That is to say, his action is inexplicable in terms of the understanding of justice that comes to light at the outset of the film. One might say that Bernie has set forth the grounds for his own execution in his original appeal to, appeal to Tom. He appealed to a certain understanding of nature, or of Tom's nature. Tom is not a killer. It's not part of his heart. But Bernie also appealed to right. What is simply... Um, we arranged for that to go by at this time. Um, um, uh, um, but Bernie also appealed to right what is simply or naturally right, as known by reason. He asked Tom, do you think I deserve to die? Bernie thereby conceded, or even established, the rule that thought can determine that one deserves to die for certain acts. Bernie contrasted his offense, which did not merit death, with others, killing somebody, crossing a friend, that presumably did. And since the episode at Miller's Crossing, Bernie has not only killed and crossed friends, but has done each twice. Tom kills Bernie because Bernie deserves to die. His execution is in accordance with the demands of natural justice. Uh, let me again stress that Tom's embrace of natural right is not in any way tinged by moralism. In fact, his execution of Bernie partakes more than a little of the Machiavellian. Machiavelli teaches that if you plan to kill someone with uh, his own arms, you should not intend announce your intention until you have acquired those arms by fraud a rule that Tom follows almost to a T. Um, let me note here that that scene includes the only explicit mention of necessity, um, when Tom says not necessarily. And just as the sole use of justice is an unmistakable allusion to Plato, the sole use of necessity is an allusion to Machiavelli's famous contention. In a sense, Tom, Tom may even be said to surpass the standard laid down by Machiavelli. He uses Cap Casper's gun to kill Bernie. Entirely unarmed, he takes the guns of two enemies, arranges their deaths, 
and make it, it makes it appear that he played no part in their killings. Tom has the makings of a good prince. Moreover, his notion of natural right does not extend far. Immediately after killing Bernie, he takes the money that he tricked Casper into bringing and places a bet on tonight's fight, presumably the one Casper had fixed. Miller's Crossing, I conclude, is an illuminating portrait of quasi-Machiavellian classic natural right, terms which Stuart will explain to you in your next class. <laughs> Comments, questions? Uh, as we will take compliments as well. <laughs> um. So I realize that the uh, Big Lebowski juxtaposition was something of a joke, but I'm. Uh, it wasn't a joke. Um, oh, okay. I mean, I, I, this is deadly serious. I did not tell a single joke in the entire talk, <laughs> no, and none that you missed. Um. So I'm a huge fan of the Big Lebowski. And I, I'm curious if there are any other um, juxtapositions between the two that, that you think are of significance. So like there are multiple actors play parts in, in both movies. Uh, I don't know if there's significance there or not. But. Uh, if there are, and I would uh, ask other people who know the Coens in the room. I know um, my friend, Mr. Lynch, who suggested that um, I discuss self-knowledge in the Coens other films, a, a, a suggestion I rejected um, uh, entirely. Um, uh, but I do not know of uh, other connections of that sort, though I do not think, uh, I mean, that, that was something of a joke, but it was not simply a joke. Uh, that was confirmation that Bernie represents Christ. Um, so, um, uh, if anybody has anything to add in regard to what is a very good question, um, uh, please speak up. I think it's interesting. It's somewhat of a of another noir, right? And and with the dude, you have so much of, of Tom. I think bouncing between uh, the different uh, uh, entities that exist in Miller's Crossing, the same way you do in The Big Lebowski. Um. Uh, I mean, I, I have no doubt that um, uh, there is, are other connections between sure. the Cones and other films, uh, and I will have to um, take your suggestion, which certainly seems plausible to me, yeah. under advisement, but um, <laughs> uh, uh, not having thought about the matter, I will not venture a, um, uh, an answer at, because this is being taped, it will appear on the internet, <laughs> millions of people will be watching it, it's going to go viral instantly, and uh, I would not want uh, to um, make a uh, thoughtless uh, answer. Um, uh, I mean, I'm expecting all sorts of offers for speaking to come in once this goes online. Um, yeah, Stuart's getting me at a bargain. Um, <laughs> That's an interesting suggestion. Um, how would that play out? I don't know exactly. I just, I just kind of popped into my head um, after you kind of mentioned it. Um, I don't know. It was just kind of the interesting um, relation as part of the uh, a grifter as well, the prostitution. Right. Uh, whose sexual ethics are yeah. questionable. Um, uh, so there's something, uh, certainly something to that. I like that. Um, I would have to uh, think about that. And being Jewish and never commenting on Christianity, because um, that would be inappropriate. Um, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm uh, right. I'm, uh, I'm allowed to express the Cohen's views on Christianity, but um, certainly not my own. Uh, but uh, yeah. No, it's, it, it, it can't simply be that Bernie set down those rules because those rules could be incorrect. But Bernie does establish the principle that reason can determine 
that certain uh, offenses are worthy of capital punishment. He names two. Uh, and it's um, uh, certainly plausible that um, uh, killing somebody demands proportionate punishment. Um, whether crossing a friend uh, also um, uh, is something that uh, demands capital punishment. It may be worse than killing in a certain sense. Uh, it might show a more defective character, depending upon whom you kill. Uh, but um, uh, that's not clear to me. But uh, it has to be the case that if it is in accord with natural right, that uh, Bernie has set down the right rule. Uh, and so, right, one would have to then articulate um, more fully what the complete uh, version of natural right is in the film. Uh, but um, uh, since that is the only scene in which the, um, I guess the question is treated thematically, or at least uh, that I can think of offhand. I mean, they have other uh, questions of justice, as um, uh, you pointed out to me the other day when Verna says, um, we deserve each other. That speaks to a certain type of justice. Uh, and so that, that is a question for me, to what extent the Cones um, treatment of these problems, and uh, I love the film because it expresses all of my opinions. Um, not necessarily my opinion about Christianity, of which I would never speak to. Um, uh, uh, and it does so in a remarkably artful way. Uh, I do not know uh, how deep the Cone's understanding of these problems are. I mean, they are obviously extremely clever, even brilliant people who have a um, surprisingly deep understanding of political philosophy. I mean, the issues they treat in the film natural right versus con conventionalism, uh, the nature of political rule, uh, the founding of Christianity, to name just a few. Uh, these are questions that um, you don't casually pick up or accidentally treat. And to do it in such an artful way speaks to an um, uh, impressive understanding of them. Uh, the question would then be, have to be, how far does that understanding extend? Uh, do they have a you know, truly deep philosophic understanding of the problem? Uh, I'd be skeptical about that, but I would not want to um, uh, deny the possibility, given how uh, manifestly uh, brilliant they are. Um, but I'm not sure that the film provides, um, uh, I mean, that's one of the limitations of a two-hour film. Uh, it's unclear to what extent um, or how deep the understanding of the philosophic problems, which is very impressive, um, uh, goes. Uh, I guess if one had a comprehensive understanding of all of the Cohn's films, uh, one could figure that out. Um, or read uh, uh, Ethan Cohn's um, senior thesis on Wittgenstein. I just learned from Zarco earlier today that, uh, that, that it was Wittgenstein, right? Yeah, Zarko, of course, has read it, and um, he's just sitting, he's been sitting there throughout the entire talk, shaking his head. What a moron. Um, Affirmative. Um, uh, yeah, Zarko. I have a question. You emphasize, you say twice, that he doesn't know Tom, doesn't know why he tells Leo. Does he, does he call attention to the fact that he doesn't know? Does he know he doesn't know? Yes, he, he does. Uh, um, he asks himself, he says why explicitly, I, why did I tell you? Um, uh, um, uh, and so, right, he, I mean, he expresses perplexity about, uh, on two occasions, about the reasons for his actions. Uh, everybody else in the film thinks they know precisely why they do things. Tom's maxim, nobody knows anybody, not that well, applies first and foremost to oneself. Self-knowledge is problematic, and Tom is the only character in the film who recognizes that. Again, that was Tom's sole mistake in the film. Uh, he had the perfect explanation for Leo, which Leo would have found compelling. Casper is not starting this war, but he doesn't offer it. 
Instead, he offers, uh, he tells Leo about his uh, tryst with Verna. Uh, um, uh, and he doesn't know why he does it. Um, he's somehow been led astray by uh, Verna's charms. Um, or she's clouded his thinking. Uh, it might be an attempt to get her. Again, he doesn't know the grounds of his, uh, he's, he just doesn't know why he did it. He just somehow did it, something that um, uh, without forethought, he uh, blurted out. But, oh, uh, uh, one second. But um, uh, it, it is ve uh, very possibly, or I think the case, that uh, Tom wishes to be with Verna. Again, uh, I love you, Angel. Uh, um, the only allusion to book learning uh, 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 is when um, uh, uh, Tom and Verna are in their apartment um, uh, and Verna says something which is meant to elicit a uh, response from Tom, a, um, a declaration of his deep passion for her. And he says, um, if I knew we were to cast our uh, feelings into words, I'd have memorized the Song of Solomon. Um, uh, uh, now that, of course, just like the declaration, I love you, Angel, is half sarcastic, but it's only half sarcastic. Um, uh, and it's um, uh, the only uh, evidence or only uh, explicit quotation of uh, book learning in the film, uh, which is Jewish. Uh, I'm not, uh, it would be um, uh, prejudicial for me to say that the Cones have a higher uh, appreciation for Judaism than Christianity, but one might infer that. Um, just before that, it says, trust me on this, will go to hell, which is very strong. Right. It's as if you really, to the source of the mistake. And then I just point to me, I mean, why is he vomit twice? That's also very unfortunate. Plus, there's no vomit. Um, yeah. Just well, no, uh, uh, Socrates, Socrates is well known to have vomited twice uh, on the day of his execution. Um, yeah, in, in the or, original manuscript of um, uh, uh, the Phaedo, um, uh, that's in there, but uh, very poor Greek scholars have made emendations to take that out, and the Cones are obviously alluding to that. Um, uh, no, I do not know why he, do uh, you have thoughts on why he vomits twice? Um, I mean, uh, it, it, he is obviously in physical danger throughout the film. Uh, and so um, that's just a uh, particularly acute expression of the, um, uh, uh, the toll that um, uh, these beatings and other things, both psychological and physical, though seven beatings in a single film is not bad. You know, it's one uh, uh, one beating uh, every 17 minutes. Um, uh, we'll talk about it over dinner. Yeah. Blonder? Um, do you think that, because uh, Tom in the beginning, you said that Tom is the character reason, right? Uh, yes. Instead of moral judgment, do you think that in the film he's actually like battling both in a way? I only say this because um, uh, battling both what? Like moral type of judgment, moral and intellectual, um, where he thinks he's intellectual, but the moral creeps up on him in forms that are unexpected. Like you said, when he was talking to um, Leo, um, he could have said Casper isn't trying to start this war, nothing like that, but he feels as far to tell him about him to burn, which to me is kind of moral way because you know it's telling the truth. Um, not to mention when he doesn't does kill Bernie the first time, it's um, right after he says, look in your heart and, and makes that appeal, which initially came from Bernie when he told him, your heart, but maybe people and whatnot. So um, that makes me think that that is another moral judgment. But at the very end, it seems as if he chooses the intellectual judgment when he finally does kill Bernie after he says. Right, well, that, I mean, that's a very good question. Um, I mean, I don't know if I would uh, quite agree that um, it's a moral impulse that leads him to um, make the mistake with Leo. I mean, I think it's more connected to um, uh, his feelings for, uh, for Verna. Uh, uh, right, his dissatisfaction with Verna seeing Leo. Um, uh, I mean, he's not impelled, if, if it were a moral uh, judgment, if it were telling the truth, uh, it would suggest he was uh, uh, impelled by guilt. 
But at the end of the film, uh, when uh, Leo uh, forgives Tom for his infidelity, Tom very sharply replies, I didn't ask for that, and I don't want it. So um, I'm not sure about that. Um, uh, the question concerning uh, what happens at Miller's Crossing in the central scene is, um, uh, is very good, and I, I, I did try to raise it without answering it um, uh, be, uh, by saying, um, uh, asking the question of whether the um, pathetic whining or the argumentation held more sway with Tom. It's not clear. Um, uh, I would like to think that it was the uh, intellectual argument more than the whining, since whining is very ugly and uh, it would right, induce me to want to kill him all the more, um, uh, 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 with no feelings of guilt whatsoever. Um, um, uh, uh, I do have an alibi, however, for the other night. So it's um, uh, uh, no um, he, he um, but certainly by the end of the film, you're right. He is um, fully and completely detached. What heart? Uh, that's you all over. A lie and no heart. Just and that's a, a very good point you made uh, about the difference between that final statement and Verna's. Uh, earlier statement about, yes, you have a heart, however feeble it is. Um, so Tom has undergone a change of some sort, um, uh, but I still think his standard of judgment uh, is throughout intellectual, and when he does stray from that, uh, it would be for erotic reasons as opposed to moral reasons. Now, you could uh, raise the question, what's the connection between erotic reasons and moral reasons? And, um, uh, we can leave that for um, uh, professors Minkoff, Lynch, and Warner, um, since they are professors and I'm a mere research fellow. Um, uh, I don't have to answer that above my pay grade. Yeah. Question about nature. Um, you know, you know, you talked a little bit about the Bernie's first appeal to his own nature, um, part of his wine, part of his organization. Um, by the end of the film, he's transgressed the limits that he set down, right? Broken laws, if you went down twice. And you talked about the ascent of Tom himself, you know, maybe within his nature, maybe with that. So, how much, what, are we, what, what ought we to make of the um, degree to which character's cha character can change, um, or, or nature can change, or the differences among the characters, the evolutions? Right. Well, I'm not sure that any character does change other than Tom over the course of the film. Uh, and that change is, um, uh, if I'm correct, and of course I am, uh, uh, that the film is an account or an allegory of philosophic conversion or philosophic self-discovery, then that's a dramatic change. Uh, or that um, uh, Leo Strauss, whom I have alluded to uh, before, says that it's like becoming somebody else. Uh, you're a different person. Um, so after Tom discovers the quest for self-knowledge, he seems to have changed. Um, though I'm not sure that anybody else in the film uh, does change or shows, shows, show themselves uh, capable or amenable to changing. Um, am I wrong about that? Is there anybody in the film who um, uh, uh, changes his character, changes his behavior, other than Tom? I mean, a lot of people are killed, which is something of a change. Um, uh, uh, um, so one of the questions I had asked my students is, what's the meaning of the title Miller's Crossing. There is this scene at the, the dream sequence at the beginning, and it shows up in the middle, and it shows up in the end. So now I'm going to half embarrass one of my students, Amber, who in one of our last classes uh, offered a response to this that I thought was smart and interesting, and maybe if she runs it by you, uh, you could pronounce some judgment on it. What do you think, Amber? My whole way of thinking about the title Miller's Crossing was that um, Miller's Crossing serves as a kind of 
bridge between two ways of thinking. It's between this world of which all the characters live in, full of the immoral actions and all the violence. And then you go through nature, you go through the woods, and then you get to kind of where the real world where we would all be at. And my thoughts were that in order to get to the world where we're all at, into our world, because the world is very much separate from ours, the only way to get to that, and the only way to leave the world of violence, is if somebody dies. That's why all the killings take place at Miller's Crossing in this place of nature, because it's like they're kind of moving on to a place that they weren't able to get to before in their own world. Uh, yeah, if I understand you correctly, I, I like that. I mean, um, uh, Miller's Crossing, uh, and I will offer a um, uh, supplement to that in a second, but it, uh, uh, the crossing could be seen as two different crossings. I mean, one is, again, the crucifixion, uh, the cross, um, uh, and uh, Bernie's apotheosis, um, as it were. Uh, the other is it could be uh, the scene in which Tom makes the um, uh, decisive um, crossover, as it were, to self-knowledge, self-discovery, um, uh, or it certainly impels him in that direction. And so I like that idea of crossing as a bridge. Um, uh, uh, give her an A for the course. Um, uh, uh, but um, uh, a different interpretation or a supplemental interpretation, um, uh, which um, uh, Right. I was initially planning to speak for two and a half hours, but um, Stuart told me I wouldn't be paid if I did that. Um, uh, so I had to cut out my, my really wonderful footnotes. Um, uh, but uh, right, in, in one of my notes, I give a uh, possible interpretation of the film's title involving uh, the idea of God as Miller. There's a play or, or a poem, a famous poem, of course I'd never heard of it previously, but um, uh, uh, from 1654 for, by Fred, Friedrich von Logan. I don't even know how to pronounce his name, uh, but this is actually famous. Though the mills of God grind slowly, they, they uh, grind exceedingly fine. Though he, with patience he stands waiting with exact, exact, exactness grinds he all. So that would be God as Miller. Uh, the cross in, in um, crossing is ambiguous. It can stand for betrayal or execution. Uh, uh, if it stands for betrayal, one might think of the titles identifying Christianity as God's portrayal. If it stands for execution, one might think of the film as an ironic portrayal of divine justice, God's uh, um, executions. I mean, uh, the film does seem to have um, uh, a taste for justice insofar as um, uh, uh, that there are four principals in the film who are killed. All four are murderers. Uh, uh, so, so the scene, um, uh, things work out rather nicely in the end where that justice is done, as it were, to all of the characters. Um, uh, but, um, uh, even Tom, uh, uh, right, um, he achieves at the end wealth, wealth, self-knowledge, and independence. Uh, that is to say, a certain type of self-sufficiency, which is the thing desired by um, uh, those living the philosophic life. But, um, but I do like that suggestion. It's very good. There's also, by the way, Chaucer's Miller's tab. Of course, but I, I assume they didn't know that. Um, yeah, Chaucer, he was a 19th century Englishman. Um, uh, right, um. But may I ask you a question? It's something you, you did talk about. So if I ask the, the students and everyone who's got to hear, what relationships matter most to them, uh, assuming at this age they don't like their parents very much, uh, thinking of my own children, uh, it would be friendship. And friend, there is an accelerated reference to friendship in the second half of the movie compared to the first half of the movie. And I ask myself, who in the movie, and in fact, that's what Bernie appeals to in the second time when Tom is about to kill, before, just before Tom is about to kill Bernie, Bernie says, we're friends, you'll do this for me, you'll say this to Casper. 
It doesn't look as if anyone in the movie is friends with anyone else. But you have all the, so are there friends in the movie? And where does friendship figure in the movie? Well, I guess I would disagree on two things. I'm not, uh, I'm willing to be persuaded that I'm mistaken, but it seems to me that friendship is a, um, uh, just as powerfully prominent in the first part as it is in the second part. Uh, and I think we do see uh, uh, one genuine friendship, which is the friendship between Tom and Leah. Um, uh, right. Every time Tom acts in a decisive way, uh, he acts in Leo's interest. Uh, when the others offer him uh, this, their friendships, when uh, uh, Casper says, uh, I give you this, you and I are friends, you, you, you'll be friends, uh, 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 we'll be friends with Leo, everybody will be friends. And the, uh, the Dane says, yes, we'll have tea. Um, the Dane is not friends with anyone. Um, uh, but, um, uh, and then when Verna says to Tom, uh, I thought you uh, said you were through with, um, uh, or, or I thought you said you didn't care for Leo. I said we're through, it's not the same thing. So he has genuine feelings for, I believe, or a genuine friendship with Leo, um, uh, or at least as close as to a genuine friendship as you can have, given the difference in rank between the two characters. Do you think Leo is friends with Tom? Does he have the, the same affection that Tom? I think Leo, I mean, Leo is an impressive guy. Um, uh, and I think that he does have a, um, uh, I think he's the uh, incarnation of a um, uh, good, if flawed, political ruler. Uh, and he seems to be loyal to his man. And um, yes, I, I, mean, I think that he does um, have genuine affection for um, for Tom. He's genuinely hurt when Tom, at the end of the film, uh, uh, as it were, spurns his offer to uh, come back to work with him. He really is, I mean, he wants Tom back. And it gives a passionate plea. Jesus, it can be like it used to be. Um, uh, I mean, it's, um, I, I thought it was interesting the fact that um, uh, the people who speak about friendship are never friends. Uh, I mean, you don't have to discuss the fact that you're friends with somebody. I mean, I frequently ask uh, Professor Minkoff if he and I are friends, um, but that's because of my own insecurity. Um, uh, uh, but usually, um, uh, uh, right, friends don't have to uh, discuss their friendship with others. It goes without saying. The only time that Tom and Leo explicitly discuss their friendship is in a markedly um, uh, unavi unaviable, one of the most unaviable moments in the film, where um, uh, 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 Leo says uh, early on the first scene in Tom's apartment, uh, where Leo says, I don't like to see my friends run down, even by other friends. And he's upset with Tom. But in the normal course of affairs, uh, friends don't have to mention, hey, we're friends. You're my best friend. You rank third on my list. I mean, I guess with Facebook, maybe you do. Um, uh, but, um, uh, it, um, and so uh, in the paper, I make the um, uh, far reaching claim that um, in perhaps no phenomenon is the distinction between um, uh, the genuine and the vulgar or political as great as it is in friendship. Um, but, uh, well, I was, I was just beginning to think partially about friendships and roles of friendships, specifically in the movie. And that was, that was something I, had, I was curious about myself, actually, like thinking about how um, when you brought up your question, I was thinking that my, uh, one, one of my first reactions was, was my parents, actually, not actually my friends at this point. And so I was, I was curious to think uh, that perhaps, uh, I haven't really begun digging deeper into it, but uh, just possibly along the lines of um, what per perhaps like what, what role friendships play in the sense of uh, what, we, what we were just talking about, how friends don't really have to outline how they're friends, you know, whether they're friends or not. But in the sense, the, the I was thinking about it, like I didn't really, I think I don't have to outline to your parents your your admiration or your affection or your uh, feelings towards them. So I was starting to think in my own head, kind of like playing with the idea of 
how that could be possibly um, Yeah. Uh, how would I answer that? Um, uh, I mean, part of the uh, one aspect of what you're um, asking about is the, uh, which I think is worth commenting on, and which you brought to my mind, is the um, uh, odd situation of Tom with regard to, he seems to be a man without a family. Or everybody, in the, I mean, that's a weird abstraction in the film. Um, uh, from family life and the friendship that you find within uh, family life. I mean, um, uh, right, um, Bernie and Verna, um, uh, right, that's the relations, the familial relation, which is explored and shown most fully in the film. Uh, right, um, uh, friends of a sort. Uh, Vern is willing to sleep around to protect her brother's life. Uh, she's even willing to uh, um, uh, teach him a thing or two about bed artistry. Um, uh, really devoted to Bernie, um, though it's not necessarily the most healthy relationship between the two. Um, uh, Tom has, um, there's, there's no reference whatsoever to Tom or even Leo having a family life. Uh, they seem to be utterly and completely detached. And again, I do love that answer that um, uh, uh, Tom gives when uh, Casper asks him if he likes kids. No, um, uh, something I've tried to teach all my friends um, with little success. Um, but um, I, I don't know if that answers your... Um, Maybe we have time for one more question. Yeah. I still have a, a lot of questions about Leo. I found him a really, really interesting character, and for the most part, sort of an even handed political ruler. But I'm having trouble figuring out what his motivations are and what his intentions are from his position of power. Um, if it's just simple pragmatism and loyalty, or what do you think it may be? Uh. I mean, I think that he has the ambition of, to the extent that a gangster town boss can be um, uh, uh, expressed nobility, he has a certain noble air about him. He thinks he deserves to rule, and, he did, um, uh, and the position fits him. Uh, he wants his um, just rewards for uh, the stature of his character, and he knows what his character demands of, of him. Again, yeah, right, his home, his office, they reflect it perfectly. Uh, Casper has this awful office, um, again, you know, aspiration to mediocrity, that's a, that's a pretty good line. Um, uh, but, uh, it, I mean, his home uh, goes to the other extreme. His home is garish, ornate, and vulgar. Casper is constitutionally incapable of hitting the mean. But Leo does seem to be something of a, um, uh, a, a real gentleman. Um, and I mean, the one motivation he has in the film, or his uh, foremost motivation, is to be with Verna. Um, and that uh, obscures his political judgment. And that's a perfectly understandable um, uh, uh, motivation. I mean, we only see, I believe, three women in the film. Um, and Verna is certainly the most attractive of the three. Um, uh, uh, you know, right, Casper's wife, a, a wife he, he well deserves, and the kid he well deserves, um, uh, um, uh, is not a particularly pleasant person, screaming in Italian. Um, uh, um, uh, but this is the life that Te Casper praises as the complete life. And the only other woman, I guess there's a cameo appearance by, um, I forget if it's Joel Cohen's or Ethan Cohen, uh, Cohen's wife as the secretary to the mayor. Um, uh, but, um, right. oh, that's fair enough, right, uh, so, um, only three, we're only introduced to three characters, or three female characters who speak. Um, uh, I stand corrected, um, and I don't hold that against you, nor attribute that to your Bulgarianism. Um, uh, um, uh, uh, but, um, uh, yeah, right. I, I mean, so I think Leo's motivations, um, uh, even when they lead him astray, do not speak badly of him. Um, uh, uh, he at least goes after the most uh, eligible, attractive, and um, uh, uh, 
and desirable woman in the film. And she would be that uh, uh, even with uh, much stiffer competition. Um, Please join me in thanking Dr. Lennox.